All right, so today we got four or five slides worth of notes, and then you have some time to work on your battle presentation projects. Um, when we talk about World War II battles um, that the United States was involved in, there's a handful that are fairly famous. D-Day is obviously fairly famous. We've talked about that. Uh, the next real famous battle that took place was the Battle of the Bulge. <coughs> So as the United States pushed the uh, Germans off of the French countryside, uh, they pushed them out of Paris, and they're driving them north and east out of France uh, back to Germany. The Germans in December of 1944 launched a counterattack offensive. It was the last real offensive attack they made during World War II. Everything else was that was a retreat and defensive battle for the Germans. Uh, it's known as the Battle of the Ardennes. It lasted six weeks in a very cold winter. There's a handful of battles that took place individually, uh, but the collective is known as the Battle of the Bulge. The reason it's called the Battle of the Bulge is because the Germans were able to cut through the center of the U.S. line and make a U shape in it. So you had a straight line and then a U that, that bowed around or bulged around the German offensive that cut through the middle of it. Uh, that's why it was called the Battle of the Bulge. You can see by the pictures, um, snow, frozen ground, um, cold. So the way the Battle of the Bulge worked, there, there's a couple things that, that made it significant. Uh, one thing is that the 101st Airborne were surrounded in a Belgium town of Bastogne. Um, so the Germans, as the Germans made the offensive attack, they were able to surround the 101st Airborne. The Germans asked the general of the 101st Airborne, Gen General Anthony McClough, to surrender on December 22nd, and he replied nuts to that. So if you ever hear the Expression nuts to that, and that's where it came from. On Christmas Day of 1944, it finally stopped snowing. Uh, the sun came out. Uh, the roads improved, and they were actually able to get the Air Force and their tank divisions to the um, to Bastogne and to the force of the Ardennes and push the bulge back. Now, a couple things that made this difficult for American troops and the Allies were the fact that the ground was frozen, and there was a lot of heavy shelling going on. And if you've ever tried to dig a hole in frozen ground, uh, you don't get very far. So they were trying to dig foxholes as these bombs were exploding around them, and trees were uh, getting shattered on top of them, and they really didn't have any place to hide, so they were very exposed, and that's one of those things that made it... Um, fairly costly. There's Bastogne. So on December 26th, after the weather cleared on, on Christmas Day, December 26th, Patton and his third army broke through the German lines and rescued the surrounded troops. The Allies then began to push the Germans back and the battle ended on January 25th of 1945. The U.S. suffered over a thousand, or excuse me, a hundred thousand casualties. Now remember, we talked about casualties, uh, that's injured, wounded, captured, and killed. So um, not all of those, it didn't, not, obviously not a hundred thousand fatalities, but it did take a significant toll on the U.S. Armed Forces and on the 101st Airborne in particular. Here's a picture of one of um, Patton's tanks. So the next thing we'll talk about is as the United States started to make their way into Germany and through Germany, they started to discover the concentration camps. We talked about a little bit earlier as Hitler started taking power, and as World War II started getting kicked off, um, 
Hitler started rounding up Jewish people to start with, but there was a handful of other undesirables. Um, you know, there's a song called Gypsies, Tramps, and Thieves. That's kind of responding to that. Uh, but it was basically uh, anybody that Hitler decided didn't meet the Aryan ideal for what he wanted the new Germany to look like. about 5.9 million Jews and millions of other undesirables. Now how many, like I said, undesirables are, are a wide group of people. Uh, gypsies, Indians, uh, a wide variety, were killed by the Nazis. Uh, as Possibly as many as 5 million other people. So it kind of depends on, it's, it's, a, it's a guesstimation. Um, the only reason they have a fairly decent number on the Jewish population is because those were recorded, but uh, it's tough to tell exactly how many people were, were killed. But as concentration camps started out, uh, they started as a um, work camps for a lot of places. And when we talked about the rockets, we talked about how some of those were forced labor camps and, and how many, you know, 10,000 people died. Uh, helping the Germans produce the rockets. So, uh, but as soon as the war started to turn to the negative, those went from work camps to extermination camps. And to end today, I have a quick thing on the Holocaust here. And we won't watch the whole thing. We'll just take a, a quick view of it so you can kind of get a feel for it. The man came up to us and said, there's a factory about a mile down the road, and you will find a lot of Jewish women in there that were dropped there, and the SS is guarding them. We opened the, the, the shed. We went in there. Fighting still raged in the Pacific Theater, World War II in Europe officially ended with Germany's unconditional surrender on May 8, 1945. Allied armed forces advanced across Europe in the war's final stages, relentlessly pursuing the retreating German army. As they did, they stumbled onto camps, often accidentally that had been established and run by the Nazis and their local collaborators. The Soviet army, advancing from the east, liberated Nazi camps in Poland, including Majdanek and Auschwitz. The British and Canadians, advancing from the west, liberated Bergen-Belsen and camps in northern Germany. The Americans, our focus here, liberated Dachau, Buchenwald, and other camps. As their armies advanced across Europe, the Allies found thousands of people imprisoned in camps. They encountered piles of corpses and thousands of skeletal prisoners on the verge of death from malnutrition and disease. This was their first encounter with the horror of what would come to be known as the Holocaust. They began to understand that the Nazis had committed atrocities against civilians, the vast majority of them Jews, on an unimaginable scale and that these atrocities were very different from the deaths caused by conventional warfare. A new category of crime had to be recognized to describe the intentional attempt to destroy a people. This crime came to be known as genocide. The soldiers were the very first outside witnesses of the Holocaust, an unprecedented case of genocide.
The testimonies of the first soldiers who entered the camps, known as the Liberators, are important eyewitness accounts of the mass atrocities committed against the Jews of Europe by the Nazis and their collaborators. Hardened combat veterans, the American GIs were used to death. Many had been fighting for years, but they had never seen killings of civilians on the massive scale they discovered. Their first encounters with Holocaust survivors at this unique moment in time give us an essential and intensely human perspective on the difference between military war and genocide. Leon Bass was 20 years old and was among the first U.S. soldiers to arrive at Buchenwald. I can never forget that day. Because when I walked through that gate, I saw in front of me what I call the walking dead. I saw human beings, human beings that had been beaten, had been starved, had been tortured. They had been denied everything. They had skeletal faces and deep-set eyes. Their heads had been clean-shaved, and they were standing there, and they were holding on to one another just to keep from falling. I saw the clothing of little children, the little children that didn't survive. Up against the wall, there were mounds of clothing. I saw the cap, sweaters, the stockings, the shoes. But I never saw a child. Harry Mogan was a Jewish refugee from Nazi persecution. He reached the United States and became a soldier and a liberator. And, and you saw uh, women on, on, on the floor, on, on wooden pallets. When I say women, you saw skeletons. Rags hanging on them, no shoes. Bones instead of faces, and the stench was so horrible. It's hard to describe. What the American soldiers found at Ordruff, a subcamp of Buchenwald, was so grisly that General Dwight D. Eisenhower, then the Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force in Europe, together with Generals Patton and Bradley, arrived to inspect the camp for themselves. After his visit, Eisenhower cabled. The things I saw beggared description. The visual evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty, and bestiality were so overpowering as to leave me a bit sick. I made the visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give firsthand evidence of these things, if ever, in the future. There develops a tendency to charge these allegations merely to propaganda. These words are now engraved on the wall of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. Eisenhower's eyewitness testimony reveals that what he saw at Ordruf left a powerful impression. Eisenhower foresaw the problem of disbelief that could fuel the denial. And that's where we'll end today.